Hey everybody, how's it going tonight? Welcome, 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 and happy Thursday. Not just any Thursday, happy Maundy Thursday. What's up, what's up? Everybody doing all right? Cheers to you, Stoic Gaming X. Welcome, welcome. Oh, what is that? The cutest little moogle. Oh my gosh. Thanks for the follow. It's J. Cole. How you doing, J. Cole? Good to see you. Good to see you. Y'all, tonight we're going to have a good time. Koopo. Yo, yo. <laughs> How we doing? How we doing? It's been a good day, y'all. It's been beautiful in Alabama today. I'm starting to feel better. I probably sound better. I was struggling Tuesday. We're doing good tonight. Gorgeous in northern Texas. Yeah, I bet y'all get similar weather like we do in Alabama. Yeah, I feel better. Um, I wasn't, like, feeling bad, but I was hyper-congested Tuesday. So, um, kind of coughing pretty bad. Yeah. But not bad today. What's up, babe? It was nice to meet you at PAX as well. Welcome, welcome. I sound less nasally. Yeah, I was super congested. That's what... That's what happens with PAX. You know, you go to a convention and you come home with the crud. Smith, happy Holy Thursday to you. Happy Maundy Thursday. Hello, Twisted Yarn. What's up? What's up? Nice to be on a wholesome channel again. Oh, no. Unfortunately, some issues about toxicity in the FF7 fandom. Yeah, I've heard. I've heard that that has been uh, a little toxic. Now, I don't know anything about it uh, because I have muted all spoilers and I appreciate y'all not sharing them with me. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I noticed. Did anybody see the uh, picture I posted of me and Max um, with uh, Cloud and Sephiroth hair? The height difference between us is unreal. Somebody said, uh, somebody said with our height difference, we looked like Cloud and Sephiroth, so I put our hair on it. It's pretty funny. I hope Max saw it. I know one of his editors, uh, Tiffany, saw it, Lockhart, but I hope Max got to see it. It was funny. I got a kick out of it. Yeah, it made me laugh. The sun went down in Kentucky and it got cold. You know, it, I, I, um, I did my uh, doctoral work in Kentucky and I, I was in there in the summer. And I remember the sun set, at least in the part of Kentucky I was in. At like 9.45 at night. Oh my gosh. I was like, how do these people sleep? <laughs> it's always sunlight. Yeah, I met him at the Final Fantasy 16 event. I mean, he was so nice. Um, you know, some, some creators, um, especially if they get big, they, they kind of get a little bit of uh, ego. Um, he did not. He did not have any ego at all. In fact, he was really nice. Um, and I said, hey, uh, you know, my name's Wade. Um, I go by Prof Noctis over on, on Twitter and YouTube, and he said, Prof Noctis, I, I've seen you come up a few times. And I'm like, oh, please, liar, but thank you. Um, thank you for playing along. <laughs> uh, he and Mr. Happy both said that to me because I got to be, meet both of them, and it was, it was really sweet. Um, really nice. Uh, tonight, we're going to be playing some Final Fantasy XV, everybody, and we do have some new people in chat, so I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to you. You've picked a good night to be here with us. Uh, if this is your first time, let me introduce myself. My name is Wade, a.k.a. Professor Noctis. I'm an actual professor at the University of Alabama um, on faculty where I teach a number of classes, including the class that you are a part of right now, which is um, Judeo-Christian Kingship through Final Fantasy XV. Uh, this is a special project near and dear to me. It is the topic of my dissertation, doctoral dissertation, and it is... Um, a class that I teach at least every year, uh, sometimes every semester, but um, it's a really, really special time. So I'm redoing all the videos this semester um, so that my students have more relevant homework if they need to go back and, and look over some things. So 
pretty good stuff. <clears throat> so thank you for being in. The way that we're going to do this tonight is I'm going to play a little bit. We're going to stop. We're going to do some lecturing, uh, meaning some like five or so minutes of uh, new insights based on some things that we're seeing. We've come through a lot. Um, the, the, the first half of the game is over. The um, Yeah, or so. Sometimes they're longer. Thank you, Lady of the Rings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet you're still in here, so don't tell me. Don't give me that. Don't give me that. You know. <laughs> Well, tonight we, we're in for two really interesting chapters. The first chapter, chapter 11, is super short. It's about 15 minutes. The second chapter that we're doing tonight is um, not long, but it is, um, it's filled with some stuff. And coincidentally, it is on this Holy Thursday, which is, um, which is uh, uh, Maundy Thursday. And I'll talk about that. We're, we're going to have some interesting intersection points for that. So... With that, why don't we go ahead and get started with the game, shall we? There we go. Right where we left off. And I'm going to swap the camera. Bam. Let's do it, baby. Combat. Watching two streams right now. Can, can your brain keep up? That's the question. I can't watch multiple streams at once. But thank you for watching both. Appreciate the support. All right, let's do this. No preface, just getting on, on board. We're going to start out chapter 11 with an info dump, some basic exposition, kind of catching us up on some things. We're riding a train. We just got on, and our dear friend Arden has also boarded the train, and he just sang the Chocobo theme, which is what we call foreshadowing. Feels good to ride the rails. Sure does. Eager to drive once we're in Gralia? <laughs> if they'll let me. <laughs> we're fortunate to have the Regalia at all. We owe the First Secretary our thanks. She'd get more thanks if she gave us a discount. Those transceivers are top-notch. I recall when the Hydrian raged, in the midst of the Empire's retreat, one conspicuous craft remained behind. The Chancellor's. Mm. The last thing I remember seeing was his ship heading for the altar. I fell unconscious and was powerless to stop him. I'm just glad you're alive. Oh, is someone else there? Gladio. He just came back. There Where he is. He go anyway. Hopefully he's in a better mood. Something caught my ear. Hey, Captain. Mission complete. Splendid. So what caught your ear? Rumors of longer Race, nights. Funny. They've been growing longer day by day. And there was talk of it back in Lucis, but recent days have shown an unseasonably sharp change. Huh. Should this trend continue? Ah, thanks, Desperito. Long, there won't also, be I love the name. Well, it's not out of the question. The Empire has already slain half of the six. <laughs> no wonder the whole world's in disarray. I guess. And longer nights mean more demons. Seen that with our own eyes. I happened to overhear a fellow passenger discussing this very same phenomenon. So he sent yours truly to seek him out. Nice police work. Well, don't want to keep him waiting. Mm. No, we don't. Back in a moment. Sure. All right, chat. So all of that was exposition. Also, hey to everybody that just hopped in. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, Jedi, thank, thank you so much for hopping in to say hi. Um, tell your aunt we said hi. So um, these, these next parts can get, get kind of confusing. So I want to break it down for us a little bit. And um, we're, we're going to kind of do a state of the world that we're getting into. Okay. So if you were in my class, I understand that this is a little heady sort of stuff. Um, a lot of lore building. We'll talk more about this in our in-person class. But um, yeah, let's, let's go to it. There you are, buddy. Did you see this? Oh, it's unreal. Yeah. The fact that they rendered all of this is what's unreal, Prompto. <coughs> my loading is rough tonight. I don't know why. I reset, I restarted my computer and everything, but never seen anything like it. Uh, 
We love Doesn't Bob Doe. Doesn't make any sense. They're talking about the darkness coming in. Oh. Hmm. What's going on? It's a real mystery. I'm not liking that snow cloud. Kind of gives me the chills. Like, who comes up with this stuff? What the hell are Whoa. you doing here? What's going on? Easy there, Arden. Shut up! Be careful there! Wait, this is for real? Oh, we're coming for you. What? Oh. I think you can hide Show from me! Yourself. Uh, knocked. That son of a bitch. Come on, knocked. You're scaring me. Oh, I'm about Serious to scare man. you. Cut it out. It's not safe. Plus, you're causing a scene. Quit. You think this is funny? Dude, are you seriously trying to kill me? Why wouldn't I? I've got you. What are you after following me around this whole time? It's all your fault! What are you talking about? Do you really mean that, Noct? Do we really mean it? Oh yeah, we mean it. Of course I do! You can't talk your way out of this. You won't even let me, Noct. Please, can't we talk for a sec? Never. <laughs> Oof. Dude, are you really trying to kill me? This is a dramatic pause. What is going on? It's going a little slow today. Oh, it had to render all of this. Yeah, this sequence is so good. Ucelio, Ucielo. The deserts of the Western continent have been littered with imperial armories and outposts. The slaying of the Galatian, however, gave birth to a paradoxical phenomenon. Snowfields and sand dunes coexisting miles apart. Noctis and friends would be wise to flee this treacherous terrain post-haste. Indeed, they would. So we're going to talk about this sequence and this whole chapter as a Noct. whole at the end of it. Are you okay? No. Where's Arden? Wait. He's here? If he is, that would explain all this weird stuff. Phenomenon. Do, do, I bet do, he's do, do, behind do. the train stopping. I Ignis bet. and Gladio went up to inspect the engine room. I say the two of us go check out the rear. Yeah. I bet he's in charge of the train stopping. Are we under attack? Whoa! Demons or no match tech. So much for a safe ride. More of them might be on board. Let's check the rear. Let's. We need to get the train moving again. I'm sure Ignis and Gladio will come up with something. That guy crawling. So. Let's go. No, you don't. Oh, we gotta do it. Get out there, fight them. Let's go. Every one of them. Let the party begin. Murder on the Noctis Express, isn't that the truth? Good five. Got him. All right, who's next? You're next. What are the odds we'll win? 
Oh, who's next? Oh. You're next. Oh, get away. Here I am dodging like it's rebirth again. Get that guy. Bam. Got to protect the train. I love a good warp, warp strike. Me, me, I'm ready. How's that? Pronto. All in bullet time, baby. All in bullet time, baby. So that's new. That's a new thing for him to say there. Striking is so good. Good news, Hats. It is just called. He said we're almost ready to roll. Oh, good. Shoot him. He's ready for round two. Notice that he is saying, Prompto is not saying his usual things. Here. He's back on his feet. Looks like they've rolled out the big guns. Prompto. I tell you. Crap. Turn around. There we go. Pretty strong, Nox. Okay. Come on! We're leaving! Yeah, we are. Oh crap. Look! They're hot on our tail! Are they? How did we blow them up first? Fine. Shoot. Oh, well there's an idea. All in bullet time, baby. All in bullet time, baby. He loves to say that. There we go. Oh, we're doing pretty good. Pretty good. He's gonna blow. Ooh, that was close. Oop. Stuck on the outside. We'll just do it this way, though. There we go. Just shoot them all. Yeah, I think the PC version of this is a little bit more glitchy. Okay. I think we've blown it up. Good. Okay, now we get to kill these guys. Whoa! gonna blow oh no with me in it oh no I'm about to die we gotta get out of here whoo that was close oh we gotta get out of here 
We are blowing up. Boom, we made it. How long were you in the dark? Yeah. And that's the end of chapter 11, everybody. Like I told you, it's about 15 minutes long. It's a quick one. It's a quick one. So let's discuss what just happened, everybody. Because that was a lot. That's a lot to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As we say. So let's chat about it, everybody. Um... <clears throat> This is insane. This is an insane part of the game. And I will tell you, before the Prompto DLC, nobody, it, it, in my classes, not a lot of people really understood. So this was a major day in our discussion. It's also part of the reason why I do it. Um, I do the Prompto DLC a little bit later than uh, immediately after Chapter 11. This is when Prompto will go on his own journey of self-discovery. But let's discuss what happened on this train ride. As Noctis is going through, beginning at the part where the train seems to freeze. Um, you notice that Prompto is acting, uh, or excuse me, Arden is acting a little strangely, right? He calls Noctis, dude, dude, are you really trying to kill me? Dude, are you trying to, um, what are you talking about? All this stuff. And um, there at the end, you get this big reveal. That every time post that that rain or that um, kind of frozen scene that you see prompt uh, Arden, you are seeing actually Prompto. It's Arden. Um, Arden has cast like a spell, an illusion over the entire train, so that Arden is appearing. Um, or excuse me, Arden is con uh, Arden is concealed. Noctis sees Arden when he sees Prompto. That's what I'm trying to get at. So the entire time, <laughs> Arden's not calling Noctis Prompto. Prompto is running around, and he's like, dude, are you trying to kill me? And Noctis sees Arden, and he's trying to get revenge, right? So he's chasing him through the train, and that's why you get that, that really interesting piece. It's a total visual switcheroo here. I'm exactly right. And so... Um, I want you to think about this from, from Prompto's perspective because a few things happen. Noctis is speaking to, um, to Arden. Um, or excuse me, Noctis is speaking to Prompto as though he is Arden. So listen to what it says. Number one, Noctis says to Prompto, why have you been following around us around all this time? It's all because of you. You've ruined everything. Okay, and so like for Prompto, we remember the, the um, motel um, discussion that they had where Prompto said to, to Noctis, I, I feel like I'm just kind of tagging along. Like Gladio contributes, Ignis contributes, you're the, the prince. What, what do I do? What am I good for? And so he already feels on the outs. And so Arden is creating a wedge between Noctis and Prompto because with Ignis's injury, Arden, Arden is, well, Arden is using that opportunity to kind of sideline Ignis. With Ignis's injury, Arden is kind of exacerbating Gladio's frustration. So dividing Noctis from his protector. And then with Prompto, who's still going to be with Noctis, what's he doing? Well, he's, putting doubt in Prompto's mind here and dividing them um, by, by Prompto now having to go through this. Does Noctis hate me? Is Noctis really doing this? And so that's, that's kind of what's happening in chapter 12. Also, interestingly, and, and uh, one of my students a few semesters ago picked up on this, Prompto's, um, Prompto's um, com combat voice, combat dialogue, in chapter 12 changes for the first time in the game. Um, instead of saying, um, oh, hi there, opening. <laughs> instead, he says, oh, it's bullet time or and things like that. Kind of kind of different sort of stuff. And one of my students said, what if every time you see Prompto at this point, it's Arden and he's fighting alongside you? And it kind of is an interesting thing there 
um, when um, it, it's kind of an interesting thing when you hear the um, the uh, cadence of Prompto's voice, right? Um, when he's talking to Noct, he's like, um, he says to him, um, the train has stopped. I bet he's the one behind it. He just has this really interesting inflection where he's, um, it almost sounds like Arden, but it's in Prompto's voice. I think it's really, really interesting. So I think that, so I could go with the idea that Arden is fighting alongside Noctis at that point. I, I could go along with it because they have changed the dialogue and they don't change it anywhere else in the game. It's just in chapter 11, which is really, really interesting. One of the discussions that we have about chapter 11 in my class are all of the times uh, that um, Old Testament kings, for example, are um, deceived, where things are not as they seem, or they, they fall into traps and stuff. And so we, we discuss some of these things um, as they have just finished their Legacy of Kings project, which is their assessment of all 38 kings after Solomon, um, which is a, a fun, uh, awful project for them. Uh, it's due Tuesday, everybody. So, or not Tuesday, a week Tuesday. Um, so keep working. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Robbie and um, Darren do an amazing, amazing job. It's a short chapter, but it is an impactful chapter, and it's only made even more from the uh, Prompto DLC, which we will do uh, after chapter, actually after um, our next stream is going to be the Prompto DLC. Yeah. Um, and then we'll do chapter 13 next Thursday. Yeah. So, okay, that's chapter 11. We're going to go ahead and do chapter 12. Um, so let's, let's get into it. Okay, everybody, let's do it. And go. Nope, wrong. That was the wrong button. Let's go here. Yeah, there we go. Oh, look at all my leveling. But not for fishing. End of days. Arden uses a stitch in time to switch appearances with Prompto and tricks knocked into hurting his closest friend. Nevertheless, a king pushes ever onward, accepting the consequences and never looking back. That's what Ignis tells him in chapter 10. We'll talk more about that in the Ignis DLC. All right, Tenebrae. I cannot wait to talk to y'all about this chapter. This is a big one. This is a real big one. And in case you forgot what stamina is, this is what stamina is. I like chapter 11. I, I It is the shortest chapter in all of Final Fantasy, but... <sighs> With a girl named Arden, really? Damn it. Beans. She was prompto. She was. Beautiful over here. What's wrong? Ignis, you've got to stop this thing. Prompto fell off the train. I pushed him. I mean, Arden made me. I don't know where he is, but we can't leave him. Stay calm, Noct. I'm as concerned for prompto as you are. Mm. But stopping the train would endanger everyone on board. Visiting ducks for the demons. What do we do? First, we drop the passengers off at Tenebrae. We'll be arriving shortly. What about Prompto? Given the Chancellor's involvement, it's probable he's no longer where we left him. In any case, he may try to contact us. Mm. Let us wait and hope for now. Can you make your way here? Gladio's with me. Are the two of you okay at least? Yes. Okay, on my way. Huh? And you I'll can imagine as as I take not just stowaways. saying what. Who can I even trust, right? And now we got demons and everywhere. Just got worse. Ah! A snaga. Ah! What's that other demon? Is he running back over here? Oh, ow! Gargoyle, get out of here! Oh, jeez. Let's get out of here. Nice backflip, not. Whoa, hey -oh. oh, good grief. 
Everybody needs to die. Woo! Bam. Oh, dead. Where do they keep coming from? Oh my gosh, another one. Get up, get up, move. Well, let's just keep running for a bit. Can't take much more of this. Oh, crap. That was a good hit. Let's keep running, boy. Yeah, panic, yeah. I think you're right. And yet we have to go, though. Okay, where's our friend the gargoyle? Is he just not gonna come after us anymore? Oh, it's getting cold. It's getting cold up here. Oh, there he is. He's running slow. Look at all the demons. Oh my gosh. They're just waiting. He sure did. As he should have. Anybody else? Do I have to kill everybody? No. Just that one. Oh, demons everywhere. blaze that's cool that's that's a pretty cool cutscene um also remember leviathan represents sorrow and regret and appears when when noctis is in deep regret over what he's done to prompto well look who's here pretty huge Horanea. guess we've got you to thank for this mess more to it than meets the eye you want to know who to thank? Come with me. <laughs> Can't wait to hear this. So this is oh. Luna's... What did you do to your eyes? Luna's hometown. Oh, no. Let's just watch for Just a, a flesh wound. Can you see? I'm... afraid not. Wow, that sucks. It's a cruel world. Thank you for your compassion. Uh, wasn't there one more of you guys? Yeah, there was. We lost track of him. Is he dead? I, I don't know. Then quit moping, keep hoping. Let me stop there for a second, Chad. I gotta grab something for you. A couple of semesters ago, I was uh, streaming this and I said, hey guys, um, that's like the best. That, that phrase, quit moping, keep hoping. That's the kind of thing that you would find on a piece of driftwood emblazoned like at a Hobby Lobby. And at the end of the semester, my class gave me this. They made me this piece of driftwood that says quit moping, keep hoping on <laughs> RNA I win. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the coolest things that I've ever gotten as a as a teacher. <laughs> I absolutely love it. It was so fun. <laughs> Quit moping, keep open. So I love that. It's a it's a 
great rule for life, you know? So <laughs> I keep it uh, on my stream for that perfect reason. Uh, they, they signed it on the back. Sweet, sweet uh, characters. Those kids, that was awesome. So, okay. Sorry, just had to share that for a moment. It was good. Did y'all actually get to see it? I, I don't think I swapped up. I'll let you see it here. Yep, there it is. Quit hoping, or quit moping, keep open. Isn't that cool? So, love that. Ta-da. Okay, back to the game. Let's do it. And in the meantime, handle what's at hand. And at the meantime, in the meantime, handle what's at hand. Uh, Ignis, that is. So if it's not you, we place. thank. Oh, thank the demons, pawns of the Imperial Army. The army that you fight for. Fought for. My men and I are in the search and rescue <laughs> business <keep> now. <laughs> you mentioned being part of the relief effort. We have a favor to ask. Ask away. In light of what you've told us, we can't allow the other passengers to continue on. Sure, leave them to me. Mm. But who's gonna drive the train? Now that you mention it, yeah. You know anyone? I do. In fact, I know two. Two. Your new engineers. He really Biggs should. and Wedge. No need to worry. They can take a licking. Only if we have to. What's all this about? Driving a train to Gralia. That all. Well, who would you have me ask? You got us there. We'll do it. Hey, really appreciate you going out of your way. Yeah. No sweat. No sweat. These guys. <clears throat> let's get a uh, let's get a look at everything here. So you can see up here. This is uh, Luna Freya's home. Here, um, it's burning. You can thank the demons. It's been under siege. We're going to learn a little bit where the demons came from, how they attacked, and all this stuff. Momentarily. Hey, thanks for the lift. We're happy to help. Can't say the climate will be as cooperative, though. You know? Right. Especially the gorge. The place is freezing. Makes sense, what with the ice goddess's cold corpse lying around. Mm. It's a rather long ride, so I suggest you bundle up before we ship out. By the way, I bumped into a woman from the manor. Used to serve house floor A. Must have gone off looking for you. Said she had something important to discuss. Mm. With me? Guess I ought to find her then. Governor. So, you've cut your ties with the Empire? Yeah. The only way we could help the people was by leaving the army. Lady A would about had it with them, as it were. Lady A? Aranea, the Commodore. Ah. Nothing but demons in the capital. Isn't Lady A what we call Lady Annabellum now? Isn't that their new name, Lady A? Hmm, interesting. Meanwhile, the crystal's just sitting there. No one in the army signed up for this. What about the civilians? Hold up in their homes. They're either lying quiet behind closed doors or lying dead. Your guess is as good as mine. Amazing. Lady A confirmed. We'll be waiting DLC. on board. Give us a holler when you're ready to shove off. Shall we? Yeah. 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 Arnea, I'll be back for you. She's got some lore that she's going to help us out with. Lord A, Lord and Lady A. Only if Arden and Arnea are... Uh, speak up, Arnea. Don't... Don't let me walk away. Okay, we are the gonna. The high listen. commander got the axe, literally. And friends, that's how we found out that Ravis died, right? So this is why I have to do breakdowns for this. Now we'll like they've added some new scenes a little bit later, but this is how on day one we found out that Ravis, Luna's brother, got the axe. We found out he was sentenced to death through the radio. And now we found out that he got the axe, literally. And the Emperor is no more than a husk at this point. Now, this is important, chat. Let's, let's watch. And the Emperor is no more than a husk at this point. 
Everyone in charge is gone now. It's total chaos. All hell broke loose in the demon labs. Mm. Elaborate. Elaborate. Unprogrammed please. MTs left to run amok. Same for the demons we caught. And now they're everywhere. They emanate from the Empire? Yeah. The capital's crawling with them. Okay, so the the demons have run amok in the um in the capital. Okay? Keep that in mind. The question is why? Why have they run amok? Let's As if that wasn't bad enough. The bastards are stronger than ever now. It's gotten too far out of hand for the army to deal with. And there's not enough daylight anymore to keep the demons in one place. And so that's how they got here. Then there's the crystal they stole, for the good of the people, which mm. never sees the light of day. <laughs> A lot of good it's doing anyone now, locked away in the Imperial Fortress. Okay, so the Emperor's lost his mind. He's kind of gone crazy. The city is like being overrun. The demons are stronger than ever. Um, if you intend more. to linger here a while, might I suggest you take a moment to speak with the people of the manor? I'm sure they'd relish the chance to share their tales of Lady Luna Freya. Better hear them while you can. We won't be coming back soon. Yeah, so we're going to listen to a lot of stuff about Luna Freya, but I want you to hear this. So let's, let's zoom in here. All right, so this is really, really interesting. Aranea gives some hints as to what's happened in the Empire. Would it have been more interesting for us to see it? Absolutely. That's a great critique of this game. It doesn't show you anything outside of Noctis's perspective um, and then the DLC perspectives, right? But here's what we can infer from all of this. Aranea says the demons have run a bug, they're on the loose, the city's in shambles, and um, it seems to all be because of that crystal. Even the Emperor has lost his mind and the demons are stronger than ever. This reminds me of a very specific passage that comes from 1 Samuel chapter 5. It says, The Philistines had captured the Ark of God, and they took it to their place. They carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it next to Dagon. That's a god of theirs. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. Well, they put Dagon and put him back in his place, but when the, they rose the following morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face again before the Ark of the Lord. His head and his hands had been broken off, and they were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who entered Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on that threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them that afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The Ark of God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us and even on our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the Ark of the God of Israel? They said, Have the Ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the Ark of the God of Israel. But after they'd moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city and threw it into panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the God, the Ark of God to Ekron. As the Ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the Ark of the God of Israel around to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Look, send the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it'll kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand had fill, uh, was heavy on it, and those who did not die were afflicted with tumors. And the outcry of the city went up to heaven. And so what happened? They returned it to Israel. <laughs> so listen. This is an amazing analogy because we've said several times that this sacred relic of the crystal that is this connection to God is um, very similar to, um, to the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Um, this is fascinating because when the crystal is sent to, the, uh, to Niflheim, what happens? It causes the demons to bolster and recoil, and they begin to infect everything around them. Okay, in fact, what we'll find out, we'll find out more of what happened when the crystal was around once we get to Niflheim in a couple of streams. But 
just fascinating stuff and it just really emphasizes that parallel that we talk about so um, I think it's a really really neat connection um, so sounds like a reason you find issue with God lunchbox this stream is for you and I cannot wait to get into that okay it's gonna be really really good stuff I promise you hang in with us okay uh, so let's keep going boom, boom, boom. okay let's go talk to this retainer isn't that a cool connection though especially since we've laid the groundwork for all of this Old Testament King stuff it's just a neat connection that they've included something as obscure as that story I think it's neat it's cool like they didn't have to put things like that in there but I it's a nice it's a nice touch for people that are, are interested in it they've been weirdly true to a lot of these stories and the just hold on, we'll get more. It's neat. You'll My see that. Word. Yeah. We don't have to Is like that it. You, yeah. Prince Noctis? I uh, yeah. Have we Oh, blessed be the stars. Just look at what a fine young man you've grown into. I am Maria, a retainer in service to House Flore. I doubt you'll remember me after these long years. I um can't say I do. Don't worry. Who I am is of little import in light of what I wish to discuss. Mm. Lady Lunafreya risked everything to spirit the Ring of the Lucii away from the Citadel. Did she deliver it to you? Mm. Yeah. Stars above! My fears have been assuaged. Lord Ravis too will be overjoyed to hear this news. Ravis too. She doesn't know. I beg of you, please see the ring to Noctis on my behalf. Already, my flesh has begun to fail me. No, I cannot accept mm. it. <sighs> By your hand, it must be done. To deliver the ring and inspire the king is your calling. You mustn't fall. Strength to go on. Find it, Luna Freya. You have the will. Go to Noctis. Show him the truth of your heart. Mm. I love that scene. I'll talk about it in a minute. I understand you will go hence to the Imperial Capital. Yeah. Lord Ravis has King Regis's glaive in his safekeeping, and it was his wish to return it to you, my prince. Though mm. I imagine it will not be easy for you to find each other. I'll get it from him somehow. I pray it shall be so. So we're going to make our way through Tenebrae here. That scene that we just watched, um, it's a telling scene because it talks about Ravis and how he seems to not necessarily have a change of heart, but he does have a... <clears throat> he has concern for his sister. This scene takes place... Um, this scene takes place shortly before she is to make the covenant with Leviathan. Ravis goes to see her, and she says that her flesh is already failing. There's something about 
making these covenants as well as absorbing the star scourge from citizens that's causing her flesh to fail. She's becoming weaker. And this is the price of the covenant that Arden talks about in uh, the beginning of chapter 9 to Ravis. She's becoming weaker and weaker, and she says, I don't know if I can go on. Can you do it, Ravis? And Ravis simply says, no, you have to do it. Even though Ravis does not believe in Noctis, this is important. Even though he doesn't believe in Noctis, he believes in his sister and wants his sister to fulfill her calling. So he ha uh, she has to be the one to deliver it to Noctis. He can't do that. And I think it's a really powerful scene in that respect. Um, that scene does get a lot of hate, but I, I appreciate what they tried to do to redeem Ravis. Now, there will be other times when we can redeem Ravis as well, but this is... Um, it's a good one. All right, let's keep going. Hey, Lady A, we're back. Hey, friend, you want to talk more? About the crystal. Oh. Remember how I said it was locked away? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They really don't allow anyone near the thing. The Emperor himself never got close to it. Yeah. The lab rats had a theory that the crystal posed some kind of threat to the demons. Tumors the way they see it, and death. <laughs> that's the reason the Chancellor had the Emperor go after it in the first place. Yeah. <sighs> Dunno, but that theory holds water in my book. Yeah. It certainly explains why the kings have always guarded the crystal and how they kept the demons at bay. Long story short, we're stuck in this rut until you go and take back what's yours. Mm. Thanks, Aranea, for the kind of vote of confidence. Again, that just kind of um, hits even more for the, um, the idea of the, the crystal being like the Ark of the Covenant. So we can go talk to some of the citizens of Tenebrae right down here. And then I want to have a mini lecture before we board the train. This chapter is pretty short, too, um, but there's a ton in it. A ton that was added later, Prince but Noctis. this is good. Yeah? Prince Noctis, were, were you excited to marry Lady Luna Freya? Because she was really excited right. to marry you. She looked so happy the day her dress arrived. She really loved you. Prince Noctis. I... <sighs> Thank you. At first, the father had mourned the fate of his chosen son. Yet in Tenebrae, the two found solace. It was not the oracle who assuaged their fears. But the girl, she holds. The true power. Notice this. this I have good. little to offer a king other than the voice afforded the oracle. Nevertheless, and I'm afraid you might find this foolish, but to be together with Noctis again, even if only for a short while, it would mean the world to me. I do not seek to guide him, merely to stand beside him. Did you notice that scene? Did, did you notice? Gintiana opens her eyes. She's had her eyes shut this entire time. The question is, why did she open her eyes? We're going to answer that question in this chapter. Lady Lunafreya worried she was burdening you with the wedding. That's not true, is it? No, not at all. Mm -mm. We're going to talk about that momentarily. That scene was added uh, to, and several scenes in this chapter were added um, as a way of explaining that Luna did love Noctis. This was not just a marriage of convenience or of politics, but the two do care deeply about one another. Lady Lunafreya was lucky to find a nice guy like you. <laughs> Thanks. 
Oh, bless her. The flesh fortifier. Will we ever see the dawn again? <sighs> what has become of our world? Cosmogony, the ring. So this explains a little bit of the ring. Before falling into eternal slumber, the six bequeathed unto man one last treasure, a ring. Yet who among us was fit to possess this gift of the gods? After some time, the ring was transferred to the hands of a man blessed with powers divine, ultimately developing the mark, identifying one fit to rule. Yeah. So that's some cosmogony. Um, I, I think I saw a question up here. It's about uh, Final Fantasy VII. Um, you'll get more of my stuff uh, about Final Fantasy VII in both New Games Chronicles, uh, which uh, I haven't been able to do one this week, but I'll get one out next week. And then when I stream the date, and I'll talk all about Cloud and Tifa and Cloud and Aerith, so I'm going to make you wait to see. Um, also, we're going to see which one my natural playthrough of rebirth has made me choose so um but which couple makes sense in terms of story stay tuned for that stream because I'll, I'll talk about it okay back to this love story now <laughs> okay so everybody's super sad exactly how we should feel on a holy thursday maundy thursday <laughs> how in the world could something like this happen perhaps this is the way it ends perhaps it's been dark for so long. Oh, looks like the night will never end. And this is exactly what they, um, this is exactly what they were talking about at the beginning. Um, that the night, the days are getting shorter, the nights are getting longer, and the, the light is fading from the world. It's exactly what Luna warned of in her prophetic speech in chapter 9, remember? All you see is Sephiroth. <laughs> Don't we all? is an imperial isn't she yes but she's not with the army not anymore at least Ooh, i like their gossip i listened to lady luna freya's address on the radio to think she gave that speech in the very place she was supposed to be wed oh, 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 i can oh, only oh. imagine how she must have felt bless <sighs> i can't believe my eyes what do we do now me neither how could something like this happen? Is the capital okay? Clearly not. Let's talk to our best boys here. Is the manor badly damaged? It's seen better days. So have the civilians. They've been through a lot. And the Chancellor's the one who put them through it. Put us through a hell of a lot, too. He never gets in our way. But he sure loves messing with us. Well, there's a good chance he got his hands on Prompto. Mm. Just hope he doesn't mess with him too bad. Let's talk to Gladdy. Bravis didn't have it much better than Lady Luna Freya. Pity we never got the chance to talk things out. Mm. Hopefully, His Majesty's glaive awaits us in the capital. Should be, as long as Ravis has it on his person. Just hope the Chancellor isn't awaiting us too. Still can't believe House Flore has reached the end of its family line. Mm. All right, so this is, we pretty much talked to all the NPCs at this point. Um, there is one thing that I, I want to read here. On the capital. Yeah, ought to find somewhere safer to hawk our wares. Sounds like the lab in Grawley is a real mess. Mm. It wouldn't surprise me if it really is haunted. Wonder where Emperor Idolos went off to. Somewhere six feet under, like the High Commander. Yep. Okay, so Tenebrae is a country controlled by House Flore with the Oracle serving as its sovereign. The gardens of Finistala Manor, tended by oracles throughout the ages, are filled with bright blue sill blossoms, the national flower of Tenebrae. You remember those from her death scene when they were uh, talking. Though the nation, <laughs> excuse me, though the nation has long enjoyed friendly relations with the kingdom, their ties were effectively cut some 400 years ago when the empire invaded and took the territory under its control. Finisala Manor um, alone remained the purview of House Flore until several years ago when a fire broke out and claimed the life of the previous oracle, Silva via Flore. That was also when the Empire attacked, so a fire broke out. Her death marked the end of Tenebrian, uh, Tenebrian autonomy and the beginning of a more antagonistic relationship with Lucis. And that antagonistic relationship with Lucis is due to, um, yeah. Yeah, it was a fire. Yeah, not a fire. Yeah, that is some imperial 
fake news over there. Grandma, I want to go home. Well, dear, right now we don't have a home to go back to. Oh. I don't like it here. Everybody is falling apart. Take heart. Everything will be all right. I don't see what good it does me to come here. I never even got to thank her for all that she's done. Oh. Show your thanks by praying for her safety. I'm gonna ask an Imperial about it again later. And I'll go with you when you do. Okay, I think we've talked to everybody. So now let's head back to Gladio and Ignis. I wanna I wanna talk about some stuff here. So <clears throat> we'll pull Gladio and Ignis into this shot. Oh now let's Zoom down. We got the fires behind us. That really captures the scene, I would say, right? <laughs> um, so, chat. Um, today is... It's, in, it's interesting that we do this today because one of the things that I do in my class is I go through the etymology and the... Um, kind of the, the history of, of some of the language that's used in this game, right? And um, we talked about Noctis, Gladio, we talked about Luna, um, Crompto, Ignis. Um, we've talked about Lucis, um, but tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about Tenebrae. Now, if you have had any relation to the Christian religion, you probably have heard the phrase Tenebrae, but if you haven't, um, I'm gonna bring it up tonight. Tenebrae is a type of service. Tenebrae in Latin is, it simply means darkness. And a Tenebrae service always happens on Holy Week. Typically it's on Good Friday, which would be tomorrow. During a Tenebrae service, I wanna show you what they do. There's typically a remembrance of all of the stations of the cross, but it's also um, a, it's also a remembrance of the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. This is why this is important. In a tenebrae service, you have a candelabra similar to this. I'm going to zoom in on this. You have a candelabra similar, similar to this. I've chosen this stair step pattern of seven candles. And the idea behind it is that it is the reverse of Advent or Christmas. Whereas during Advent, candles are lit as you approach the um, arrival or the birth of Jesus, the light coming into the world. During, um, during Good Friday and during a tenebrae service, it's a service of darkness. And so you are, as the words of Jesus are remembered, you are extinguishing light after light. And then the final light comes with Jesus saying, it is finished and it is um, extinguished. It is similar to a menorah in that respect, Roxy. This is a really interesting choice of name for Luna Freya's hometown, especially as we visit it at this point in the game. As a city that means darkness, it invokes, it evokes this kind of remembrance, right? It evokes the idea that the light of the world is quickly being extinguished. And what I want to call to mind here is that thematically in this game, the light in Noctis's life is one by one being extinguished. Ignis has been extinguished. His connection to Noctis is being extinguished. Um, Gladio's uh, connection to Noctis in chapter 10, it's under duress, right? and it's extinguished. Prompto is now extinguished. Luna, dead, extinguished. Regis, extinguished. Jared, extinguished. You have all of these supporters for Noctis that have been utterly distinguished, leaving just Noctis. The world is dark, dark too. The world is growing in darkness and all of this. Um, in fact, Noctis, um, yeah, it, it does mean um, uh, Nox, Nox can uh, be a variant of darkness, right? So uh, moon, dar uh, moon of the dark flower or something like that is one way of thinking about that. Uh, yeah, the Witcher logo. This is a Witcher specific chair. Yeah, it's moon, dark, fencing foil. 
<laughs> yeah, um, or flower, I, I suppose. Yeah, um, it could be. Uh, do you think so, Flore? Well, Flore in, in that way, but with the E in it, right? Um, that would be more of a floral sort of thing. Um, moon dark uh, fencing foil. I haven't heard that one. I've only um, read the translation as a flower, as a variant of Flore. No, you, it's not? Huh, interesting. So what would you make of that with moon dark and fencing foil? Kind of the sword of the dark moon. That's an interesting idea. A weapon. A weapon of the dark moon. Fencing foil. Interesting. So in all of this, I think I think this particular scene is so powerful because darkness is fully capturing Noctis. And the question is, is he, as he, his name is, is, is it to be translated night of the light sky or is he the um, light of the night sky? You know, the, the, this is going to be an interesting piece for the end of the, the game. Now, as we get onto the train here, Tenebrae, uh, Tenebrae wears white while Lucis wears black. That's correct. Hey, Dustman, thank you so much for the sub. Thanks, friend. Um, yeah, thank you for the camera reminder. Of to flow. Okay, good. So, with this, we're going to board the train. Now, friends, this is maybe one of the most important scenes in the entire game. This is one of the most important scenes in the entire game. It was not in day one, <laughs> but uh, can I tell you this? It is, um, it's something that I called even from day one, which I'm so proud of because every time they would add new patches and new story sequences and DLC, I was like, are they going to ruin my dissertation? And they didn't. They just further did it. There wasn't a big theory crafting community for Final Fantasy 15 back in the day, but if I, I would have been the... Uh, the grand leader of it um, if, if, um, if there was so but I will say it had a lot that wasn't fully spelled out but the fact that I was able to do uh, deduce these things means that it was there um, and so I'll defend that it's all there it's just near impossible to figure it out King Knight and Sun Nightlight I kind of like that okay so all that to say these next scenes are going to be really really important it is going to be the rest of our stream so, buckle up. Ready to depart. Just swapped out the damage cards for some new ones. Give one of us a holler when you're ready to shove off, then. And we're ready to shove off, open, then. If you need a break. I don't need a break. I need a train to take. Shall we shove off, then? Shove off. Climb aboard. Quit moping, keep hoping. Don't worry about the civilians. They're in my good hands. All aboard! Can't say the same for you. Watch yourselves in the capital. Hmm. We will. <laughs> Thanks, Arnea. We'll see you around. Look out for Prompto! It's... snowing. Get your ass on board! Yes, sir. Just make a shorter train, yeah. Like, seriously, we don't need all of that, but... I guess you kind of need the regalia. Gavoris Rift, or Garavis Rift, a uh, frozen ravine where the fallen Shiva lies, a solitary railroad carved through its unforgiving snowscape. With Biggs and Wedge driving, the train makes its slow and steady way toward the Imperial capital. So the Empire believes they have killed Shiva, and this is her body. Again, it happens off sc uh, screen. Um, it's told to us, um, but also it's not terribly important. Um, in the grand scheme of things. But uh, I feel like this is a part that they should have elaborated on a little bit more. It would have been nice. Okay. Boy, attention all, passengers. all three of you. We're on our way to our final destination in the Imperial Capital. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy it. 
Look at all that snow. No wonder it's so cold in here. We must be approaching the Glacian's cadaver. Won't be a blessing if all we got's a body. Let us hope we pass through the gorge without incident. It's what's after the gorge I'm worried about. It's a big deal because if, um, if Shiva is no more, then Noctis will be unable to gain the blessing of Shiva. And so that's what they're trying to convey here. I don't think they do a great job of it, but they are trying to convey that um, in, in this segment of this chapter. Once we get through Gore of us, we're there. We've come quite a long way. Okay, we can run this way really fast. And we'll get to see a couple things, get a few items. We have to be fast. Mega Phoenix, that's helpful. Oh, get this guy. Can you? Yeah. Oh, then bank note, great. Get that thing. We keep running a little bit, get that thing. And then back here we see it's our friend, the Regalia. There's our car. Our car's going to the Empire with us. We love that. And now, in the interest of time, we have to run. Not because I'm trying to hurry the stream up, but because the train will park whether I'm done exploring it or not. Uh, missed that, but no turning back, no turning back. Nice wheels, thank you. Also, hey Leander. Going through the rocks, yes. No, 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 we want to explore. Don't examine the seat. Now we gotta run, 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 run. Vroom, 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 vroom. So here we are, look at all this. Up here, yeah. Hope we missed something there. Okay. Yep. Still nobody on this train. Nobody on the train. Making sure we don't miss anything. Okay, good. Okay, and we're at the end. I think we missed. Oh, there it is. So, everybody. Here's a little exposition. The fall of the Empire. After his forces suffered crif crippling casualties against the Hydrian and Alticia, High Commander Ravis Nox Flore was sentenced to capital punishment. However, the Imperial Army has yet to appoint a successor to the late Lord Flore. Moreover, waves of Magitech troopers gone haywire have fled Hallhawks, Hallhex Armory and begun assaulting the citizenry. Could this be karmic retribution of those who turn their backs on the gods? So... All this for a newspaper. Now, it's important to get this newspaper if you don't have all of the cutscenes that they added because you wouldn't really know that Ravis was totally dead. <clears throat> Welcome, Jeffrey. You came just in time. Thank you for the cheer, friend. Hope you're doing well tonight. Okay, so time for some story. Oh, pick, pick up the fire extinguisher. Can we go pet Umbra and go visit our memories? No. Ain't no stopping this train we're on. There's our friends. Y'all want to talk? No? It's depressing when it's always dark out. Still dark. Seems there's scarcely anything left of day. It's all gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So true. All right, well, we've done everything we wanted to, so seasonal depression, that's it. And here we go, everybody. First, we got a little bit of a fight, but it should be okay. Watch me die. Watch me die here. After I said it's not a big deal. Into the Arctic crevasse. I'll say watching... Um, Watching this in widescreen, it is my first pl time playing it, like, full ultra-wide. It's kind of cool. Oh, we're coming up on the Glacian's body. There's her arm. Your first try emote ready. I wonder what it could be this time. Attention, yeah? What's wrong? You may have noticed we stopped. As for the cause, our side We'll take a look. I oh, hope wow. it's just a quick snow shoveling job. Indeed. Oh, you're here for the good part. You're here for the good part. 
It's freezing. You better keep moving to stay warm. The Glacian did this. I think I can see her. And so, everybody. She's lying dead. Damn, it's cold. Let's clean up out here. There we go. Good. Uh. Gladio. Gladio, get them all. Stab, stab. There we go, there we go, there we go. Ignis! Just the thing. Clean up, clean up, let's go. Bam, bam, bam. Blind side, blind side. Just like that movie with Sandra Bullock. More wraiths. More wraiths? Ignis! Wrong way, buddy. Oh, nailed it. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. Bam. Bam. Me. I will not wear that gaudy orange. I will not wear it. It is not in my color view. Oh, here's the big guy. Death Claw. Ow, that was pain. Oh, dodge that. Ignis! Oh my gosh, thank you for the gift sub. Let's go. Come on, come on. Oh, you jerk. No, you don't. No, you don't. Gladio, Gladio. Woo, that was a close one. Got him! Link strike. Heck yeah. Somebody help me. Oh, Roxy, thank you for the bits. Not the death ray. From the death claw. There you go, Iggy. Ooh, ow. Oh no, somebody help Ignis. Stop rolling, not. Oh, Ignis is dead. Okay, we'll have to help him. I only have two, though. Look alive, Iggy. Woo! Could we not? Could we not? Have a little high elixir, maybe. Ignis, Ignis again. Ow, he's on fire. Oh no, is he down again? Somebody help him. We're not fine, Iggy. Don't worry about no need to be the hero, Damn. buddy. Death Claw is a problem. He keeps killing Iggy. Ignis again. We almost got him.
Got him, baby. Got him. Hurry up. Ain't got time to waste. I think I don't know that. To no fanfare, but we got him. Alright, friends, here we go. Get your notebooks ready. Hey, knocked! What's up? You better get in here. Something's got not it. right. Come on, there in a sack. Right. No way. Prompto. You hold it. Oh, that son of a bitch. Oh boy, we're gonna do a lot of pausing here. Oh, it's real cold. Oh, thank you for the gift sub. Thank you, tribe. Stop! Stop, damn it! Where is he? Where's Pronto? Oh, there you are. I'm worried about your friends. They've fallen and they can't get up. Why not lend them a hand? A coldness that can only be hers. Ah, here we go. Listen to this. Ah, the face you wore the day. Let it now be done, as promised to the Oracle. As promised to the Oracle, this is good. Surprise! We found Tales our Shiva. Of the past and hopes for the future are manifest in the King of Kings. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. We're gonna break down so much, and that's gonna be the rest of this stream. Okay, every line we're gonna be examining. Her first thing she says is, "Tales of the past and hopes for the future are manifest in the what? The King of Kings." So. King of Kings, as you probably know, is a very Christian um, and messianic understanding, um, uh, usually related to Jesus and Christian understandings. But King of Kings is also a messianic understanding um, in any culture that has a Messiah where that Messiah is a king. Right. And so this is a king that will reign over all the kings. And she's specifically calling Noctis this. Don't miss that. Now, why is she calling him that? We're going to discuss that. <laughs> Frostbearer's blessing shall be his. The Frostbearer's blessing shall be his. Okay, we're going to talk about the past first. Take note, because it gets crazy. The six have safeguarded this star since time immemorial, each of a different mind, but united by this common purpose. The gods' protection extends to all creatures here below, even to the mortals created in their image. And let's stop there for a second. The six have guarded this star since time immemorial. And the gods, uh, each one has a mind, a, an attribute, a perspective of their own. They each have their own specific character. We have been breaking down these gods from the very beginning of this game as different attributes or aspects of the divine with titan we talked about creation creational intention rather we talked about rama being uh being provision right we talked about leviathan having sorrow and now we get to shiva now and we're also going to get to ifrit and we're going to eventually get to bahamut but here we're talking about these six gods each of a different separate mind that are all governing the world according 
to their particular whims. And then it says that the, their protection extends to all creatures here below, even to the mortals, what? Created in their image. And now, if each of these gods has a specific mind, each one a different attribute, then it bears to reason that the image that they bear might also invoke the image of all of these attributes that are displayed by the gods, right? And so, um, let's keep going with this. This idea that mortals are created in imago Dei, which is the image of God, this in, intrinsic sort of um, familiarity. Uh, we talk about the image of God in my class, and we, we discuss it specifically regarding the attributes of the divine. We do not mentioned that it is uh, merely a, um, a, or primarily even, a physical representation. And this is really important chat, uh, important, chat, because if it's just a physical representation, then the question is, well, whose image? There's a lot of diversity in the world. And so what happens if a person um, is born with a less than normative set of abilities, a less than normative set of, uh, of features? Right. Uh, what happens to people that are in in um, in ways disabled or something like that? Do they still bear the image of God? It, it can become a racial thing as well. Which race bears the image of God? If it's primarily physical, then there's a lot of complications here. And that is an incredibly, incredibly difficult for us to do. So it's got to be more than that. Some of the worst cases of of um, kind of religious exclusionism has taken place because some groups of people claimed that they bore the image of God more than others. In fact, that was uh, pretty common during uh, any uh, region where they had this uh, theology and they also had slaves, right? It was the idea that we are the image bearers and you are kind of our, our created things. Um, and that is absolutely um, theologically bankrupt and nonsense. And that is why we do not um, say that the image of God is primarily a physical thing, but it's more the co-creative power of people. Does that make sense, chat? So the, the mortals created in their image is really important. Um, though here are there six. Um, oh, okay, so um, Smith, this is a good question. For our purposes here, um, there are six gods without including Garuda and Bismarck, um, though I'm sure we could do something with them. And so um, there are a number of different attributes of the divine. We could include things like holiness. We could include things like righteousness. And in fact, in Final Fantasy 16, we do expand that a little bit. But for these purposes here, I'm utilizing primarily the six attributes that are revealed to us in what we would call the, um, the archetypal stories of Genesis 1 through 11. And those are also sharing some lineage with some of the Babylonian and ancient Near Eastern uh, Mesopotamian texts and myths. And so those six attributes are creational intention, provision, sorrow or regret, as we see in the flood narrative. We have justice, we have wrath, and we have compassion. And all six of these are kind of at work. Let's keep going. We're going to continue this discussion, all right? They are feeble creatures leading fragile lives and clinging to foolish fancies. The frost bearer scorns these visions of hope which melt like snow in the sun's light. Now, this is interesting because Shiva is um, not on the side of, um, it, it does, it, it, it is not, um, Shiva is not really friendly to Noctis here, right? Um, uh, Desperita, oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And you have a great night of sleep. I appreciate you for hopping in. Have a great night. Bye. Um, and so with this, um, Shiva is not necessarily humanity's biggest friend on the, uh, or fan on the outset of things. They are feeble creatures, she says, leading fragile lives and clinging to foolish fancies. The frost bearer scorns these visions of hope that the humans have, which melt like snow in the sun's light. That's really, really interesting because you do get this in a lot of Babylonian texts um, when you're talking about the god um, El and you talk about um, some of the, the other 
uh, divine beings, I think, in terms of like Tiamat and uh, Marduk and all of these early sort of figures in Babylonian myth, they have a, a, a disdain for humanity. And that's where you get their flood story, right? That's where you get a lot of this contention between the gods and humanity. They see them as just like you know, feeble creatures. They're very, very much like the uh, many of the gods in the Greek pantheon. They just see humanity as disposable, right? And yet, watch this. This is good. <coughs> yet the pyre burner admires their strength of will. For their reverence, he grants unto them his flame and the world of man flourishes. Which is very much like Prometheus, right? It is very much we're giving humanity fire. We're giving them the power. And so the pyre burner, also known as Ifrit, admires the strength of human will. And for their reverence, he grants unto them his flame and the world of man flourishes. You remember this. We talked about this very briefly in chapter 7 when we went to Style of Grove in the Vesper Pool. It's, where we, it's there where we discovered the um, the world of Solheim. This was the first creation. This was the first civilization. Think of it as like a Garden of Eden sort of mentality, right? I think that that's a really good uh, analogy here because there you have the people that are worshiping God um, or gods uh, in this respect. And uh, the God, in this case, Ifrit, the pyre burner, grants them the power of fire, which is a co-creative sort of thing. So Ifrit and human will. That's exactly right, Leanderthal. They have the power to co-create. Fire is a great creation mechanism. You can use it to forge weapons. You can use it to bake. You can do it to do. Uh, you can use it to do any sort of thing. But it is a power that's given to them by the gods. That's part of this idea of the people have the image of God in them. So let, let's keep going. His benevolence warms the frozen heart of the frost bearer. Oh ho! And so we get a little bit of a love story here. Ifrit and Shiva, they're in love. And so his benevolence to humanity warms the frozen heart of the frost bearer. And that is really, really interesting. Let's keep going. The mortals have earned her respect. He, her love, and He changes her mind. He changes her mind, and if we are to look at these two as divine attributes, we see that the divine attributes are not isolated, but they are interacting. Isn't that interesting? It's, inter it's, not, it's not that wild because you and I, as humans, we have conflicting emotions all the time. We constantly do. It's, it's kind of the reason why we have trouble making certain decisions. Can we do this? But what if we do this? It's the reason why in some moments, um, if in some situations, we may feel the need to both offer forgiveness and compassion as well as wrath. Let's keep going. It is not long, however, before some among us may ascend to new heights of hubris. The people of Solheim spurn the gods who bless them, the gods they once worshipped. So Solheim rejects the god. This is their fall story where they were in league with the Freet and the gods and then they turned away. As co-creators, they began to, you know, create for themselves and have no concern in worship for God. Um, I see a lot happening with the flood story. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so uh, they ascend to new heights of hubris or pride, and they spurn the gods that bless them, the gods they once worshipped. And so this is the result and act, and this is really interesting. The ungrateful mortals incur the wrath of the pyre burner. He seeks to raise the very civilization his flames once helped build. And so here we have the wrath of the pyre burner, Ifrit. He seeks to raise with fire the very civilization his flames once helped build. Got it? So it's the idea that Ifrit has now turned against them just as they turned against him. And so this wrath begins to be incurred. And you, this is the result of the fall narrative, right? Everything was fine. Everything was chill. And then they turned away from God. And what, did, what happened? Well, Ifrit turns against them. They must pay for this. But the six are sworn to defend the star and all her inhabitants from harm. And at times you catch that they are sworn to defend the planet to defend their creation and its star uh this star and all her inhabitants from harm and at times what is it from one another from one another 
They must defend it from one another. And so what happens? Listen, this is, this is the key point of understanding this game. Let's go. The flames of war surge as Solheim fends off the pyre burner's fire. The gods' pleas for peace fall on deaf ears, and the battle rages on. Mm. When the smoke clears, the world of man is in ruins. Their star left scarred for time eternal. Wearied from war, the six seek solace in slumber. And, and so, what happens as a result of this? All of the gods are trying to defend the star in the way that they think is best, each according to their specific attribute, right? And so you have some that are defending humanity, and you have some that seek to destroy humanity. And on the scene that we just showed, or the scene that we just saw, you see them all fighting against one another. Titan standing up against Leviathan, Bahamut standing above them all. Uh, you have Rama um, fighting against, uh, fighting against um, Ifrit. And all of them kind of uh, warring against one another. This is the war of the, the astrals. It's the divine war. You know? And so this frames what this game is about. And she's about to explain exactly why. And I'm going to explain why this is so cool and important in just a second. The tale of our shared past is entrusted to the King of Kings. That he may see it to its conclusion. So all of this, <clears throat> all of this is shared with Noctis, the king of kings, so that he may see this story to its conclusion. Somehow with Noctis, he is going to bring order to the chaos of the divine itself. The divine cannot settle on how they are going to defend the star and save the world. Is it going to be, and, and we're simplifying it a little bit with the attributes that we're using, is it through creational intention? Is it through provision? Is it through justice? Or is it through regret and sorrow like we see in the flood narrative of Noah uh, where, where God wants to wipe out everything because he regrets making humanity? That's in Genesis chapter 6 where it says that God regrets making humanity. Is it going to be through wrath or is it going to be through compassion and forgiveness? And the problem is it has to be all of them, all of them at once. This is a critical sort of thing. I want to lean in right here and I want to talk here. The number one question that I get as a professor, as a religious professional, as a chaplain, the number one question is, what do you do with all the inherent contradictions that are in the holy texts? And this is across a lot of different mythologies and holy texts and religions. What do you do with this? But for my purposes, um, and especially the purposes of this particular class, we're talking about the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible. And especially in the Old Testament, Christians are, are incredibly guilty of this. They'll say, well, you know, the Old Testament is all about wrath and the New Testament is all about grace and forgiveness. Well, that's not true. There are wrathful events of the divine in the New Testament and there are compassionate events of the divine in the Old Testament. I've tried to share several of those with you, even in the way that we discussed the flood narrative. But what we see is that God's attributes all are displayed and conveyed in those first 11 chapters. You have creation and creational intention. You have... Um, you have, uh, number two, you have provision. God is providing for the creation. Number three, they have, um, they have uh, this God has sorrow and regret. You have, uh, that's, uh, that's shown in both the flood narrative and it's shown when, um, when God says over King Saul, I regret the day that I made him king, right? And regret, um, yes, exactly, Twisted Jar, regret begins with a place of I had better believe I, I believed that they could be different from this and it's similar to what Luna says to Leviathan you know what I know you know I know what you must know Leviathan that Noctis is the king of light and he will bring darkness to the store she reminds him or Leviathan of who Leviathan is and who Noctis is 
And this is very similar to the way that the prophets and, and Moses particularly would remind God of who God is and remind God of who the people are. It's why in the Psalms it says, remember, O God, your people, remember, O God, your promise. And this sort of thing is constantly conveyed. I think that that's really, really, really interesting. And so then we look at this um, again. Um, <clears throat> and the, the question then is, so if God in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, has creational aspects and uh, mercy as well as wrath, as well as justice and all of this, the question is, isn't that a contradiction? And I would say no, it's not a contradiction because all of these in some cases are the motivating factor of, of um, building up and, and creating and in interacting with the world. <clears throat> Lunchbox, you bring up a great point, right? Um, if God, if gods have human attributes that, uh, then they aren't as fallible, uh, that aren't, uh, then aren't they as fallible and human, thus adding to the belief that there is nothing. Okay, so this is an interesting point. The way that, I under, uh, that I'll explain it is, is like this. And I can explain it um, from the, the uh, Hebrew and Jewish sort of understanding as well as the, um, the New Testament and Christian understanding here. Um, so for the, the um, Hebrew Bible understanding, there is the idea that this is a, a God that is de uh, terribly complex. You know, and all of these different attributes are at play against one another and, and that God has a free will. Now, this idea of fallibility is, um, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure that um, something being fallible is, is necessary. So there's an inherent fallibility and self-limiting of the divine when you allow for free will. Um, I kind of mentioned this in some of my Final Fantasy VII lecture videos where we talk about it is the power of God to self-limit God's self in allowing there to be human uh, sort of, um, you know, free will in, in all of this. Um, and so because of that, God is risking for God's self the ability uh, or, or the, ten, the the possibility, rather, of being heartbroken over what humanity is doing. The question then, and this is where that really, this is what really hangs up people um, in a lot of ways. What does God prioritize? What does God prioritize in the world? Depending on who's telling the story, um, you're going to get some specific answers. One of the questions that I'm constantly asked is, why do, why do we, we can go so far as uh, humans can make errors and, and cause pain and trouble in the world? We can go so far as free will, and that's fine. But what about things like natural disasters, right? And I think there's a, a few di different ways of, of looking at this. Um, I'm going to use earthquakes, for example. Um, this is a classic example that we use in, in discussions of theodicy, which is questions about the justness of God or the questions of the goodness of God. Um, so earthquakes cause insane damage, right? Uh, destroy lives, destroy livelihoods and all this kind of stuff. And people inevitably ask after things like that, uh, is it God's will? And God's will is such, a, I could do an entire series on God's will um, about, you know, what is, what is God's will and how do we interpret it? And it, or is there a better way of discussing it? But when we talk about earthquakes, we understand because of modern um, understanding of science and stuff that it is caused by tectonic plates. And on the one hand, it causes a lot of death and destruction. Is the death and destruction God's will? Well, maybe. But really what's happening is, here is that those shifting of the plates in many ways serves as a central coolant system for the planet. And therefore it's able to promote life on the planet because of that. So ultimately through this potentially destructive force, it is for the survivability and the prosperity of um, human endurance. 
This is similar to what it's like in the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, oftentimes given a, a pretty raw deal for being um, as kind of the law books, right? This is where some of the most um, difficult um, laws of, of the, the Old Testament, particularly Hebrew Bible, are brought into play. And the reason I bring this up is because those laws are also very, very much um, used in modern day to create an ethic and way forward for people that it really may or may not pertain to. I think particularly in in ethical sort of things. Um, so while it says things like, um, you know, don't eat certain types of food, shellfish, for example, don't wear cloth of, of mixed uh, sort of uh, material. It also it, it also has things like um, uh, don't lie with an animal and, and things like bestiality. It also has very specific rules for women that want to get involved when their husbands are in a fight and how that's going to be on their head. All this kind of stuff, right? The way that I describe these laws and the, the Levitical law is uh, two ways, okay? Number one is um, number one is through uh, the first law is a what we call a holiness code, and the second law is what we would call a purity code or a cleanliness code. The holiness code is about connection with God. Follow these laws, and your connection with God is good. The purity and cleanliness code is a little bit more about survivability. It's like, if you eat this, you will get dysentery and die like the Oregon Trail. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it's like, if the goal of God is to sustain human race, then you kind of understand, especially as they're living in a, in a desert, there's this question of, okay, how do we survive as a people? And also, how do we maintain right relationship with God? The problem is the, the Bible isn't particularly explicit about which laws are holy codes and which ones are purity codes. Make sense? But for this people at this particular time, there's a reason for uh, creating a people and all that kind of stuff. So there's that. Okay, l let me read a little bit of the chat. Y'all have got some good questions here. Why would God design a flawed system to heal the planet, knowing in omniscient wisdom the toll of life, and still call himself a good, just God? I think that, um, you know, the, the design of a flawed system to heal the planet, I, I would come at you with two, Not I would respond to you, not come at you, sorry about that. I would respond to you with a couple of, ideas with that, and uh, various theologians would, would pick up on this. One explanation would be that this, if, if there is a divine, right, and if there is a, um, an afterlife sort of thing, then this world is temporary, you know, and this world, because it is um, flawed uh, uh, due to uh, the fall, the sin, and that's inherent in, in both the Genesis narrative as well as Babylonian. Several it, Most world religions have a fall text, right? Most mythologies have a fall te uh, text as well. And the idea is there is something beyond this. And so right now we live in a flawed system. That was not what it originally was. And that's one way of thinking about it. The second thing, a uh, second thing that theologians might say about this particular question is that the goodness of God is not necessarily um, that the world is perfect and the perfect place for humanity, but it is that God is interacting with that world in the midst of its fallenness. All of the explanations ultimately go back to either the the um, the fallenness of human will or the the star scourge, the sin of creation, whatever the, the mythology has. In Final Fantasy 15, it's the star scourge. The world is crap because of the star scourge or as a result of this divine war. Um, so a, again, that may not be a satisfying explanation to you, but there is a, a degree of that. Now, one other thing that I, I do mention to my classes, and this is turning into a much longer lecture. I love the, the interaction that we're having here. This is very, very similar to what we do in my class. Like we ask theological questions and I, I try to bring in some resources and stuff. Um, and I want you to hear me. I'm not trying to, I, I want you to hear me. Like, because this is a religious topic, 
It is inherently a personal topic for a lot of people. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything, but these are the ways that people reckon with some of this stuff. Okay, that's, that's an important thing to kind of remember in all of this. So we are, we are on a search for um, understanding here more than being right. And so I just want to be real clear about that. Something I teach in my classes is what I call progressive revelation. Um, it's not like conservative versus progressive. It's nothing like that. But progressive revelation looks like this. Um, if you were to go through a linear chronology of history, the people today, simply by virtue and the blessing of hindsight, know more about the story of the divine than those that lived 5,000 years ago. Now, this isn't how close you are to the divine, what personal relationship, but it is you can learn from ages past and incorporate it into today. So, for instance, the books of Scripture, to use the Old Testament, for example, the books of Scripture that were written during Babylon are going to have a little bit more nuance to who God is than, say, the early Babylonian texts found in Genesis 1 through 11. Now, they are edited and redacted in Babylon so that they are brought up to speed a little bit more. But it's also why you have Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which historically come from two very different groups, and they're spliced together to say there's a fullness and a nuance to this God that is both high and exalted and very near to the, to, uh, the people. So kind of an interesting sort of thing. Um, yeah, a lot of really good comments in the chat here. The perspective of the divine, if it exists, is not the same as our own. We don't have the whole picture. Yeah, and that, that's a very common um, explanation, Yarn. I, I think that's a really good one. Um, so, uh, yeah, we don't have the whole picture. We don't know what we don't know. That was something, um, sometimes that's brought up in a lot of my classes. And it's something that I have a little bit of critique on because it's like, um, yes, the divine ways are not like human ways. And we kind of wrestle with that a little bit. Um, but, um, it's also a loophole big enough that you could drive an 18 wheeler. <laughs> through. <laughs> so it's like, well, we just don't understand. And that is a fine explanation when you're talking about the limitation of humanity. At the same time, it's not super satisfying for somebody that's going through it. I, I, th I think that we, we would agree on that. Um, but it, it can be a source of faith. It can also be a source of friction. Um, Smith, as one article I read once put it, you can take the P Israel out of Egypt, but you can't take the Egypt out of Israel. <laughs> one of my professors said that uh, one time, and he said it jokingly, but that, that is, uh, that is a, a good thing, yeah. Uh, but we're in this image, uh, we're in his image with his traits, Lunchbox Chat. Yeah. Shouldn't we be perfect by design? And, and that's, uh, again, a, a lot of your questions, a lot of your questions go into the downfall of creating a free will organism, you know? Um, so the idea that God or gods can create humanity or creation and then give creation a mind and will of its own that could reject or follow them, uh, follow the divine. That's the, that's kind of the damnable offense, right? That's the, that's the choice that changes everything. Um, so when they turn away from the divine, the divine order is, is separated and the, the earth begins to suffer as a result, either through lack of human, um, you know, uh, responsibility or because the the planet itself is in some ways um, affected or the universe the cosmos itself is in some ways so uh, all of these questions are um, why create a flawed being and hold them accountable for their original sin knowing it would come to pass yeah and so this I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, God's will here this is um, this is good um, I highly suggest a book by an Anglican priest called Leslie Weatherhead. Um, it's called The Will of God. I think that you can probably download a PDF of it on online very, very easily and very quickly. And so um, I, I think that this is uh, it, it's a great way to do this for a fuller explanation. This is this is really, really cool. So 
Leslie Weatherhead says that when it comes to the will of God, there are three things that we're actually talking about, okay? And this is where it gets a little bit dicey with some people, but this was very satisfying to me. I'm, I'm similar to you, Lunchbox. I get, I get pretty skeptical at times about a, a lot of stuff, but Leslie Weatherhead clarified it by saying the will of God, when we all say the will of God, it gets really murky because some people say, well, it was the will of God. Oh, God answered my, answered my prayer that I, um, that I found a parking spot at Target. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, well, interesting. Somebody told me it was God's will, even though I prayed for my loved one to survive their illness and then they died. So what what is God's will about? Is it about parking spaces or is it about losing loved ones? And this is a really challenging thing to talk about because everybody just uses that phrase God's will. Well, Leslie Weatherhead says that there's three types of God's will and we really should we would do ourselves a favor if we utilize these three vocabulary terms. Number 1, he says that God has an intentional will. God has an intentional will is what God intends for humanity to do. And then there's either the um th there is either um free will that can be interjected or it is the collateral of someone else's free will, or it can be the collateral of a natural occurrence, like an earthquake or something like that. Something that just happens in the world because it's a fallen world or whatever. Um, and this is important because um, God intends for people to live, to love, to survive, um, and to endure. That, that's a really important thing. But then you get this secondary piece while it's in God's intention that people would live and love him and love others, the circumstantial will is that God also intends for them to have free will, and that comes into conflict. So the circumstantial will is temporarily God's intentional will is defeated for the purpose of there being this circumstance that is allowed in God's grand good order. This is what Leslie Weatherhead says. He actually asked some really compelling questions that are incredibly difficult that I just love. I'm, I'm not going to share them with you unless you just really, really want to because um, y'all are y'all are into it, but I don't want to exhaust you because y'all are being a great chat and a great class tonight and being very respectful. And I love the way y'all are talking about all this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is what this stream is for. I know a lot of streamers don't delve into religion um, and all that kind of stuff. I love chaos. So here we are, um, I, I guess. Um, so let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, so he, he says there's the intentional will, there's the circumstantial will, and ultimately, because God is still working um, in all of this, God is going to bring out about an ultimate will. It's March Madness, everybody, and all, also I think Alabama is playing and maybe has already lost to UNC um, at, at this point. Somebody in the chat, you can update me. Um, but one thing that I, I talk about when I talk about this is that there is, think of, think of the, the divine will for humanity and for individual lives and all this kind of stuff as an infinite basketball bracket in March Madness. Okay. Think of it like that, where everything has an option. And a person is like, shall I live here or shall I live here? Now, does God care about that? Maybe, maybe God is saying, you should move over here. And then people are going the other way. Well, in that case, whether they follow God or they don't follow God, the question is, well, where is, does God have a will in there over here? Right? And so ultimately this bracket kind of pyramids out. Are you with me? And at each decision point, similar to like a great RPG, think Baldur's Gate, the programmers, the designers, had to create every single option. <laughs> and so they are aware of every single option, but they give you the choice. And that's similar to what free will is like. Now, unlike, say, um, the Baldur's Gate devs, people who are religious oftentimes we'll say that in every situation, God has a preferred intentional will. But what happens if you choose a circumstantial will, like something that isn't perfectly in line with God? Well, there's a chance to turn back. There's a chance to not. There's a chance to turn back. And this is what where, where we get into things like, um, uh, we can get into things like, um, uh, like uh, um, repentance, for example. 
Um, so I, does that make sense, everybody? In God's omnip- uh, um, omniscience, God knows the entire basketball bracket, but is present and interacts in the moment of decision at each one of these points. Is the, are, are you with me there? That's the way that I like to think about things like omniscience. And that's the way that I try to teach it in my class. I think it's really cool. So you can cite Lucifer and his fall. God designed and created his son, I would assume, in knowing perfect uh, SOP would fall. Let him um, and punished him for it, but let him go through that. Um, okay. And his fall, God's design created his son. Okay, I have some comments on that lunchbox. I'm actually going to hold them for a later stream. Um, can you all stop typing for a second? Because my stream labs is like stopping. And, it's, and I don't want to miss any of your things. So let me just catch up for just a second before you type anything. So just kind of hold off for a second. Um, I think it boils down to what God ultimately wants. I think someone said this is the Hebrew God doesn't want slaves or anything to, um, in terms of allegiance. Okay, yeah. Um, Roxy. I know, but I mean, was it for us? Um, was it based on the fruit from the tree that made us turn from him? Or was it being cast out? Okay, so um, that goes back to one of those archetypal questions. The question is, um, is the Garden of Eden a story that happened once? Maybe. But is it a story that happens every day for every person? I think yes. I, I think that that is the the reason why it's an archetypal story and it exists um, in many forms across different um, religious texts. Um, so um, I think that we do well when we when we find the um, the truth. Hear me, I'm, I'm using it in the terms of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, when we find the truth of something instead of the fact of it. And so it's the question of what does the quote good life look like regardless of circumstance and how do we subvert that good life in us through choices that that we may make um the appeal of course there's a temptation to give in but what does that does that mean that we've trusted the god who said he'd provide for us Ooh, graham hancock is doing incredible work right now as far as history religion archaeological um graham hancock i'm not entirely familiar with graham hancock i'd be interested in that if you're in my you're in my discord uh, tribe why don't you share that with me i, I like that admitting you don't understand is a great place to uh, for me, we don't know. We don't know is less about create, creating a massive rug sweep, but more about maintaining curiosity. Great, Yarn. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, I personally uh, am an atheist, grew up Jewish, but I find the rhetoric of all this super interesting. Awesome, Roxy. I'm, I'm really, really happy about that. Not, not that you're an atheist. <laughs> I mean, that's great for you if that works for you. But um, I'm glad that you find the rhetoric of this super interesting. Um, one of my favorite things is um, when I can talk to people that have a variety of different beliefs. In my classes, we have atheists, we have agnostics, we have Muslims, we have uh, Jews, we have Christians, we have people, uh, sci- scientists, <laughs> I guess that's another form. Um, not scientists. I've never taught one of those, but um, it, it's interesting stuff. More like, okay, let's find out what we don't know. One could argue this was never the initial design, the initial fall of Adam and Eve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the, uh, the fall narrative, the sin narrative. It makes sense to me logically that there's a God, there's no way to fully understand this human, so I'm chilling. Okay, cool. Just living on faith. Great. Um, dang, God works in mysterious ways. Always felt like a deflection of the answer of accountability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that there's a lot of that. Um, God works in mysterious ways. And that's great if you're on the good side of mysterious ways. But if you're on the downside of it, then you got questions. It's like, okay, so is God good, right? That's where the theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y question is. Okay, here for this. Jedi, uh, Jedi, you say, you can tell how far back in the chat I am. So thank you for letting me catch up. It's so hard, uh, especially when people use it to justify bad actions. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So that's that's so good. There's a song by Peach PRC where the song by uh, lyrics are, I heard my dad pray over a football game. Guess God. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, man. That's a good take on God's will. And that's where it gets murky, right? Does God give a rip if the Crimson Tide wins? I would like to say yes because I'm an Alabama fan. But, um, you know, it's a it's a whole thing. Who was it? Um, was it uh, Voltaire or was it um, Mark Twain? I think several people have said this. Uh, they say um, in God's... Uh, great uh, love, he created man in his image, and then man returned the favor. And so we're all kind of crafting God in our own image in some ways. And the, ch- the, the challenge is to listen and learn, like we talked about in chapter 10 stream, um, to listen and learn about the wholeness and the fullness of God. Um, 
And, and that's why we learn, right? That's why we have discussions like this. Accountability to God may look different than accountability. Yeah, that's good. Just spitballing. I like that. Um, oh, hi, Jedi. <laughs> uh, not exhausted. Well, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that y'all are enjoying this. That's great. Um, I want to ask, I have a thousand, thousand burning questions. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have time for all the questions tonight, but you know what? If you hang out in this chat long enough um, over the the months and stuff, hopefully we'll have opportunities to do that. I'm, I'm not one of those, as you can imagine, I'm not one of those that's like, no, we don't talk about religion. Um, we may not talk about politics, but you know, <laughs> that's, that's kind of where we are. Choose your own adventure. Yeah. Yeah. My husband is a programmer and hearing him make these choices in, is insane. Yeah. Yeah. Dev's making every, okay, great. Okay. I'm kind of catching up. I heard <laughs> Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me just kind of catch up for a minute. Okay, good. I'm glad that you're, you're still listening and working. I hope we're not too distracting for you. But what makes this the main timeline? How do I know which world and outcome I'm in? Am I constantly dividing a million times per moment? Yeah, and that's, that's a great question. Um, so I, don't, I wouldn't call it timeline. I would simply, because we're, all of our choices are linking up with everybody else's choices, right? It's just my choice, you know? Um, I, I'm reminded of, um, what is it, Deuteronomy chapter 30, I think, where Moses says to the people, God says to Moses, who says to the people, um, I've said before you life and death, prosperity and destruction. So choose life so that you might live and it will go well with you. And that's kind of the, the whole basis of like free will, is, right? It's like you can, you can do well and you can choose life or you, you can choose death. And at every junction point, you're doing that. And every junction point for someone else is doing that. And sometimes their junction point is affecting your junction point collaterally. Think about when you were kids, their junction point of decision affected you, whether you like it or not. And somehow, um, um, uh, theists believe that in God's grand design, somehow God's got some sort of preference and intention to all of that, which I, I think is kind of important and interesting. Uh, there's also the thought that God already knows what they will choose and everything that will happen. So the choices aren't important, important, important. As I, I was in Boston last week and are often just an illusion. Yeah, that's, that's possible. That's possible. The existence of an infinite flow chart does not restrict the ability to choose a path. Yeah. And now different traditions are going to argue on, on that one. They're going to say, God not only knows the outcome, but because God doesn't, act, if God knows the outcome of your decision making and God doesn't step in to change that decision making, then God has essentially refused to do the thing that might save you or damn you. And therefore, it is God's will that you are damned or saved. That is the hardest core of hardcore Calvinist. Uh, sort of understandings. Um, and there's there's other groups as well. Uh, predestinationism is, is not uh, exclusive to Calvinism by any means. But um, goodness, we are getting hyper theological tonight. It's good though. Um, yeah, so I would, um, the free will is the only thing you can't reconcile with God. Life is cyclical and predictable. I believe even fall from God is God's plan to teach appreciation of what's good. Yeah, fair. Um, for me, um, I, I can give you a little bit of my thought on this. Um, I think that God has intention. God allows circumstance. God sees the whole scope. And then God hopes and desires for us to kind of go into this ultimate will. But ultimately, ultimate will of God is in the end of all things, right? Where God and humanity are, uh, according to the, the Christian ideas, at least, um, they are um, reunited in many ways. And we'll, we'll certainly talk about that in some theological conversations later on. Um, definitely pin a, uh, put a pin in some of this stuff. I, I think it's good stuff. Life is a collective story. So individual stories bereft of a happy ending is ultimately serving a greater story. A lot of people do agree with you there. Yeah, I think that's good. That's good. Um, I don't know. Religion is interesting. And I had a conversation with faith when I, got, I was younger. As I got older, faith became a broken concept for you. Yeah, that happens to a lot of people. Kind of like when Gandalf says small acts of kindness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Settled on a notion of peace and purpose. Yeah. Omniscient play um, in the topic. Can, uh, can we say that we weren't influenced? Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't be a jerk. Oh, Roxy, good rule. I like that. 
just because uh, he knows all outcomes doesn't mean he's choosing the outcomes. And, and again, that's going to be different um, perspectives, theological perspectives in that. I believe as long as you're leasing with your, uh, leading with your heart and look for opportunities to be kind to people on their journey, uh, that is the recipe for a beautiful world. Hmm, I love that. Um, I love this. Oh, good, Racy. Uh, the definition of omniscience is all-knowing. Okay, fair. Um, religion hasn't been a facet of your life. Uh, you're pulled out of private school. I think your ADHD makes it hard to grasp. Ah, fair. Yeah, that's good. It's getting saucy. Hey, dust man. I don't know how far back in the chat. Oh, that's actually pretty recent. Good. Never thought of the war of the six could get us all into all this. Hey, this is my class, right? This is what we do. Uh, that's why we talk about some theological stuff. I think I've said enough for the next. No, 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 no. Listen. Okay, listen. Yes, we've gone long tonight. This was supposed to be a shorter stream. But I knew that these chapters were action-packed. Okay, and this is one of the best theological discussions that I've had on, on Twitch and YouTube. So thank you all for contributing to this. I did catch up. Yes. Um, so thank you for, for pausing the chat for me. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so uh, your liberal arts degree is coming out to play. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Okay, we're actually in the middle of a cutscene right now, believe it or not. This isn't just a theological talk. So we're going to get back to it for the sake of my sweet, sweet students that are uh, that are hanging in here like, holy crap, is he ever going to finish? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, students, uh, your homework. I I'm definitely going to have to like <laughs> put, put some timestamps in this one and be like, oh, skip ahead. <laughs> Didn't we all just forget? Um, yeah, join the Discord lunchbox. I'll create a, 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 new, um, a new thing where we can have, I have a new channel that is just theological conversations and we can continue these offline. I can't promise that I'll always get to it. I will simply say that, um, that we, my goal is not to convince anybody of anything. Let me simply say that again. My goal is to help people understand. I want people to understand things. I don't want them to be misled. I don't want them to feel coerced, any of those kind of things at all. Um, and it's the same way I lead my classroom. Um, we're not going to silence opinions. We're not, but we, we're going to engage, you know, and I, that's, that's one of the things that I love. Um, it's what I love to do um, in both uh, the classroom and then in my work as, as a chaplain as well. Some of you have recently found out that I do some, uh, some, some uh, chaplain work. And these are the questions of life. These are the questions of life beyond life. And I think they're important questions for all of us as we seek to make meaning of our time together. No, I totally know that lunchbox. I love that. Yeah, not everything needs an answer or has one. And um, that's okay. Um, you know, I got three degrees in this stuff uh, because I, I wanted answers. And uh, not, that's not to say I have all the answers now. In fact, after my first degree, I was like, I know everything. My second degree, I was like, I know nothing. And then my third degree, I was like, what is everything? <laughs> you know, that's kind of what a doctoral program does. Um, that's, that's good stuff. The most important thing for me is to find a practicality um, to religion, right? To find a practicality that says, what do we do? What's the ethic? Um, that's behind this. This is the question that, that we have in uh, my faith tradition all the time. And um, it's, it's one thing to say, I believe this no matter who it hurts. But my question is, okay, well, what's the, like, what, what's the practice of that for the people that you are hurting with this particular belief? Like, what, what does that even mean for them? What are you asking them to do? Um, and that's, those are the questions that excite, not excite me. They're the questions that I'm here for, you know, the three stages of getting a doctorate. That's exactly right. I don't know a person that finished that third degree. that came out saying, I know everything. I am an expert in very, very, very specific things. But the thing that degrees do is it helps you expand your places to look for information. Um, and Google has also done that, but that's good. Okay, shall we finish? Shall we finish this chapter before I lose my voice? <laughs> Y'all are the best chat in the world, everybody. I just got to say that. That was so good. Okay, so that was all about the past. <laughs> Let's ask about hopes for the future, shall we? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? So what's going to happen in, in the future? In the days that follow the war, while the six are still asleep, the pyre burner is sought by a man who draws him away from the light. His peril is sensed by the frost bearer, 
she rushes to his aid, only to be filled by the foreign hordes. Those masses are now one with the darkness. Darkness that before long will swallow the six and the star they protect. This star's fate no longer rests in the hands of the gods. Mm. It sits on the shoulders of the chosen. Deliver this world from darkness and, and grant, grant my, my love, love release. release. Okay. I promise I will. I promise I will. So, let's stop for a second there. I'm, this one's not going to be long, you guys. But, um, Sh Shiva, Gintiana, has now said to Noctis, you are going to be the one to bring this divine war and chaos together. And that is going to be the theme for the rest of the game. Do you remember at the very beginning of this game, the very first scene of the game, the very first scene of the game, whenever I ask my class this, they always say, oh yeah, when they're pushing the car. No, no, no. The first scene of the game is when they are approaching the throne with Ifrit on it. Does that make sense why this is the first thing why that's the first scene does this scene make that first scene make sense chat this story is not merely about noctis becoming king it's not about the fall of insomnia it's not about reclaiming the throne it's not about luna and marrying luna it is about noctis bringing peace to the divine war and that is the, the whole reason for everything. It is the reason why people wanted the, the story of Noctis and Luna. They wanted the story of insomnia. But the story is only the peace being brought to the divine uh, conflict. And this is where we begin to entertain messianic understandings. How does the Messiah invoke and bring deliverance to uh, of order to chaos and this is um we're, we're going to talk about messianic uh insights in just a couple of streams and what a messiah actually is versus what it's kind of been co-opted to mean in a lot of ways uh the savior of the stars so that's that's really really interesting um so let's uh let's continue because we're almost done here and this is so good this is a good luna moment everybody so let's get get excited no more um no more of this let's go well is no longer of this world but her thoughts remain, mm. and they must be known. So we're going to ask about Luna's thoughts here. This is great. When the boy begins his existence on this star, the girl is met by the High Messenger. It is ordained that she will work with him to return the light. The girl reaffirms that promise. The High Messenger is moved by the girl's determination, her heart warmed by the girl's benevolence. Her faith in mankind is restored once more. Her faith in mankind is restored once more. Sister, cease this madness. That boy will never be king. Noctis is chosen. It is ordained. You of all people should know. I know that you are throwing your life away. That may be. Mm. It's my choice. If only... If only I could... hear his voice once more. If we could laugh together as we... did as children. Oh, you're going to love this, guys. You're going to love as it. We once dreamed. Wherefore does the lady weep? Forgive me. I vowed to only cry where prying eyes cannot see the tears in mine. Yet others need not hide their grief. Is she so different from them? No. She is no different at all. She wants exactly what they do. To be with the one she loves. But won't though she may. 
It is not to be. The lady's thoughts have been hurt. The love she bears the king Watch. shall never fade. And in time, her feelings shall be known unto him. Gentiana. Watch this right here. And if the words are not spoken from her lips, then the messenger shall see that they are heard. The God's favor and the lady's love shall be with they him open. evermore. Why do they open? Thus it is promised between the oracle and her familiar. God. Chat. Her eyes open. I am open. deserving of your kindness. Thank you. And so the promise is fulfilled. As her words, words were with him, so, so shall, shall my blessing. blessing. Okay, chat. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Her eyes open. Her eyes open every time in this game, every time when she's talking about the love that Luna and Noctis have. Every time she speaks about it, her eyes open. Every other time, her eyes are shut. Why is that important? She tells not just this story. And then she says, and so you shall have my blessing. Every god in this game has performed a trial. He's re they've required a trial of Noctis with creation and Titan. It was about Noctis being able to protect creation in a fight. Rama had provision. You had to go and scavenge to be sure to provide. Number three, you have regret and sorrow. Noct uh, Luna, Noctis watch, watches as Luna is killed. And you've got the regret of the divine taking out its pain and suffering on the, the area. And Luna's killed and Noctis embraces sorrow at that point. And here, you have the one that embodies in seeing Luna and her love for Noctis. And what attribute is that but love? It's love and compassion, care. And so the trial that Shiva offers to Noctis and to Luna is the trial of love. It's the trial of, of undying commitment, not giving up. But it is that idea of love in compassion. Noctis has fulfilled that trial, just as Luna has fulfilled that trial. And that's why Shiva doesn't have a trial. She gives the blessing because she sees the love between them. Does that make sense, chat? This is just amazing. Not giving up, I would actually say, is uh, uh, for Leviathan, I, I, I can see the not giving up, but I can see that the trial of Leviathan is about overcoming sorrow particularly and overcoming regret if I could have just been there. This is such an important piece. Shiva's trial is love and that's why Gintiana's eyes open every time. Okay, let's finish this. Get ready, y'all. So good. Yes, it would, lady. Yes. Thanks. O king of kings, restore the light unto this world. Yes, Jeffrey. Farewell, dear Noctis. Yeah. Luna, I'm sorry. Mm. I'm sorry I couldn't be there for you. Regret coming Even out. When you needed me most. There was so much you wanted to say. So much I wanted to say. And now, I never had the chance. I'm so sorry.
I won't let you down. I know you won't. Isn't it so good? Let's go deal with this jerk. Then we get the mark at the Glacian. Yeah. What Boom. are you looking at? Smashes him with the trident. Luna's trident. Hey, wake up. This is a huge moment of responsibility. No, yes. Are you all right? Yeah. He hasn't put on the ring yet. I saw the Glacian. It's in him. It's yeah. okay. She's gone now. You guys check out our drivers. Got it. You good? Yes, I'm fine. Let's go. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you hopping in. I appreciate you. Okay, let's run to the end of the train. And that's the end of this stream, everybody. <laughs> what a journey it's been tonight in two of the shortest chapters. <laughs> Yeah. I feel I've earned the right to call you not. Mm. For a moment I felt death's chill wind. Such is the might of the gods. But then I remembered I'm immortal. Such is my blessing and curse. Ah! Your attack hurt me nevertheless. My feelings at least. And after all the memories we've shared, remember this. Ah, I should have asked if you remember him. Truly a blast from the past. Nay. Ah. Ah, ah, ah. You mustn't take what's not yours. Where is he? He. <laughs> the little gunman's a short shot away. Where? Where else but Gralia, the seat of the Empire. I'm sure he'll be delighted to see you. Uh. And you might even find your crystal. With all these demons about, you could certainly use it. Yeah. Off you go, then. I wouldn't want to keep you from your friend. <laughs> And that's the end of the chapter. What? Ah! Oh man, we'll talk about Gralia next time. And that is the end of the chapter. What a stream tonight, you guys. What a freaking stream. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. We kind of left on a cliffhanger. And we will get to chapter 13 in two streams. Next, we got to figure out what happened to Prompto. And so our next stream on Tuesday is going to be all about Prompto. If you are interested to see where we are going and you want to do some reading for, uh, for next Tuesday, you should definitely check out the book of Daniel in the Hebrew Bible and Old Testament. You're going to definitely want to read the book of Daniel. Uh, definitely the beginning parts, maybe the first three or four chapters, and then uh, you can just kind of peruse the end parts. But we are going to be really, really, really getting into the book of Daniel. So get excited about that. And it's going to be so good. Refresh yourself on a little bit of, um, a little bit of uh, Babylon and Babylonian captivity as well. And it's going to be amazing. You're going to love that stream. You're going to learn some things about Babylon. It's going to be a great time. So look forward to that on Tuesday. And then next Thursday is the big one. The next Thursday is the huge one. And uh, next Thursday, chapter 13 is the reason that this is a class. Chapter 13 is the moment where I said, I, I can do something with this. 
um, because I'd never seen this depicted before. Chapter 13 is my favorite chapter in this game. It is the least loved chapter by the world, but it is my favorite chapter in this game, and I'll explain all of that next Thursday. Um, And uh, in order to prepare for that, you may want to read, let me get you the exact address. You may want to read, if you're up for a little bit of reading, 1 Samuel chapter 9 all the way through chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 9 through 15 in the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament, okay? So there is that. Um, in fact, uh, we, we will, um, oh yeah, thank you for that, lady. Um, we will hop over and give a quick raid to Roxy. I'm going to bed, but um, I will let us raid Roxy real quick, and you can all go say hello to her. Um, chat, let me just say again, I know I say it every time, and I absolutely mean it every time single time you guys are the best chat in the world um this channel is great because you are great okay so anything that we do like it is because of people like you roxy is a regular in the chat we're, we're really grateful for for everything that she does for the stream and everything that she is so um oh no 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 i'm speaking uh in in real time here so um yeah oh man uh, i just love the way that we do this i love that we can have these kind of conversations like this. I, I just love it. Um, I, I don't know of a lot of streams that can do this. And I am so looking forward to future, uh, future topics and things like that. Y'all are, y'all are just the best. So thank you for being the best. And with that, let's go raid Roxy. Um, I'm going to see you Tuesday on, uh, at 7 on, on here, okay? Uh, remember to hop in the Discord and let's continue the discussions offline, everybody. And with that, let me load up the raid. Okay, here we go. Starting the raid. See ya. Good night, everybody. Always.